Celebrate Thanksgiving with Safeway. This week at Safeway, get Whole Signature Farms frozen turkey, 10 to 15.5 pounds for $8 each, or 16.1 to 22 pounds for $10 each. Member price of the minimum $50 purchase, limit one per household. Plus, packs of Coca-Cola, Pepsi, 7-Up, Dr. Pepper, or AHA sparkling water are buy two, get three free. Limit three free items. Also this week, get five-pound bags of Signature Farms russet potatoes for 97 cents each with digital coupon. Limit one. Visit Safeway.com or head in store for more details. Hey, it's Christine from Story Worthy. Today on the show, ballerina, Broadway actress, and now author Georgina Pascogan talks about her new book, Swan Dive, The Making of a Rogue Ballerina. In City Ballet, I play a lot of strong women. I am a jumper and a turner. What I mean by that, listeners, is that like I do a lot of like the split jumps, like think of like gymnasts. I excel at jumping and I also like to turn, so revolve on the little tippy toes. Ballet is an extreme art form. Being a ballerina is basically like being a silent actress. Today on the show, ballerina, Broadway actress, and now author Georgina Pascogan talks about her new book, Swan Dive, The Making of a Rogue Ballerina. Stay close. Hey, my name is Georgina Pascogan, the Rogue Ballerina, and you're listening to Story Worthy. Welcome to Story Worthy. My name is Christine Blackburn, and I'm coming to you from Los Angeles, California. Whether you're a longtime fan of the show or a new listener, welcome to Story Worthy. Now, I hope you guys listened to the story last week with Stuart Zully. Stuart is an actor who I know you've seen before. He's been in over 100 films and television shows, so I know you'll recognize him when you see his picture. But anyway, Stuart Zully also happened to work in Yankee Stadium for 40 years. How interesting is that as a uh, a vendor? So go back, you guys. Listen to Stuart Zully's story last week. It's super interesting. He even wrote a book all about it. His years as a uh, vendor in Yankee Stadium. Very cool story. But not today. Stick with me now because today I'm going to re-air a story from, I believe it's 2021, with ballerina Georgina Pascogan. Now, as you know, on the show, I generally have on comedians and comedy writers, but ballerinas, I mean, come on, that is interesting. So I had the opportunity to talk with a ballerina, Georgina Pascogan, and she talks all about her book, The Rogue Ballerina. And uh, it's so funny, this episode... This story that she's about to tell you, it, it isn't even actually a story. In fact, at one point, I say, okay, let's stop talking. You know, we got to wrap it up because it's time for your story. But she never actually gets to a story because it's just a conversation. And it's all about ballet and New York City. And so if you have somebody in your life who's into ballet, New York City, musicals, etc., this is the episode for them. because And for you, for that matter. Because this is a real a good episode. And I appreciate you guys tuning in, whether you've heard the story before or not. I'm actually not in Los Angeles right now. I'm in New York City in a closet in a Hilton Garden Inn. And I'm recording here because I went to the U.S. Open yesterday. How about that? Yeah, very cool. I got to see Ben Sheldon play Tommy Paul, I believe his name is, yeah. And then I saw Coco Goff and Caroline Wozniacki. And so two great matches, super fun, and I am very happy I got to come. This was like a bucket list thing for me. Anyway, you guys, um, I know you're going to enjoy this episode with Georgina Pascogan. And please remember to sign up for my mailing list over at StoryWorthyPodcast.com. And don't forget that we're playing Story Smash, the storytelling game show, on Saturday, September 23rd at the Lyric Hyperion in Los Angeles. Wendy McClendon Covey is going to be there, as well as Blank Patch and Danny Zuger. It's going to be the funniest night you have in 2023, guaranteed. Go over to StorySmashShow.com and check it out. All right, you guys. Thank you again so much for tuning in. You are the reason why I do this podcast at all. If it wasn't for the listeners, 
I would just be speaking into a into an iPhone at a Hilton Garden Inn in the middle of New York City in the closet. Oh, wait, that's what I'm doing. All right, you guys, that's not the point. The point is, I love you, and thank you very much for tuning in. All right, you guys, without further ado, put your hands together for the very talented Georgina Pascogan. Super excited to have in the house our first ballerina. I mean, look, I've had 689 episodes of Storyworthy, Gina, and you're my first ballerina. Hey, there's always time for a first. Yay! I am so excited. And I met you a couple of weeks ago uh, at one of your performances slash book launches for your brand new book, Swan Dive, The Making of a Rogue Ballerina, which is such a good title, by the way. Thank you. Did you come up with the whole title? I had to fight for that title. (laughs) I'm not going to lie. We fought for that title. But they like Swan Dive, right? Um. We weren't sure. We weren't sure for, I I was, I I, like, this was a night where I was like not sleeping and I was like, I'm going to go to sleep. I'm going to sleep on it. It's going to come to me. I'm going to manifest it. I woke up in the morning because I wanted to play on Swan Lake because I feel like if people know what Swan Lake is, I mean, you had Black Swan and, um, which was like a huge movie that kind of crossed over in a, um, into a more popular sense And I just wanted to do a play on that. Um, And then I was like, also be funny because I am inherently just a wacko. And (laughs) and then I woke up and I was like, I got it. Swan dive. (laughs) It's it is. It's so perfect. And a swan does always fit a ballerina. It's just. Yeah. But, you know, swans are like really mean. So it's like, it's funny on a lot of different levels. It's nuanced. It's a nuanced title. (laughs) It's very nuanced. And the word rogue is nuanced. But wait a minute. Is a swan, is that the same as a goose? No. No, they're not the same. Okay. There's a goose, a swan, and a duck. Is it true? Yes. I believe that's true. Okay. Let's start the joke. There's a goose, a swan, and a duck crossing the road. (laughs) And the first one says, what the fuck are you? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> okay, listen, you guys, I'm allowed to chat with Gina this way, not only because I already met her and we decided to, she decided to come on Storyworthy to talk about her own swan dive and about her book, but also because Gina and I are from the very same area, Western Pennsylvania. Gina, you're from Altoona and I'm from Pittsburgh. And you're also one of six kids and I'm one of six kids. This is it, it's it's uncanny. It's it's quite it's quite eerie. Well, I'm I'm sitting and this is one of the rare times that I am actually in Altoona, Pennsylvania, right now. I drove home. I, it's like a rare 36 hour window that I had. I never get to see my family, and this is like the busiest time. It doesn't seem to be slowing down until like 2022. Um, and who knows what's going to happen with the pandemic raging out of control right now. So I was just like, I'm taking my window. I'm coming home. I'm hugging my parents. Um, Gina, thank you so much for coming on, man. That means so much to me. You're taking part of your, you know, 48 hour window or whatever at home to come on story worthy. Thank you. Well, I committed to you first. So see, speak, speaking of keeping commitments, I committed to you first. And then I was like, <laughs> I'm going to go home. They understand. So. Yeah, well, and also in your book, you know, you talk about when you have a window like a Christmas time when you can go home for like 18 hours and you guys, you know, would all jump in the car after a performance of Nutcracker and start heading home and you have other friends that live relatively close. That's pretty that's pretty rare, right? Ballerinas from Altoona? Um yeah, I there well, I happen to be close friends. I consider them my brothers. Um, with a, a, There have been a number of people that have come from central Pennsylvania that have gone off to have very successful careers. So the joke is, like, we like to say there must have been something in the water that created dancers. Or, um, well, yeah. But, like, uh, the brothers Angle, Tyler and Jared, are from right up in Juniata. And um, my very best friend who lives now in Italy Um, she danced with me. She had a successful career before she decided to go a different route. 
Yeah. Well, that's really fun. Yeah. Would you talk about those guys, Tyler and Jared? It's like, it sounds so 80s kids. Like it's so we are. funny to we me. Were. Those names are hilarious. And I know your name is Georgina, uh, but people mostly do call you Gina, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So here's here's what I want to talk about real quick before we get into your story. And that is going to be more about the book Swan Dive and your life as a ballerina. I wanted to ask you about like, OK, so you grew up in Altoona Catholic. Of course, that's the other thing that's a through yeah. line. Right. Yeah. Western Pennsylvania in general. Mm-hmm. And what are your other what do your brothers and sisters think of your career choice? And what are, what are they what are they doing in life? I'm just curious. Um, so I. You would have to ask them what their exact opinions are. I do feel like generally they, um, I it must feel, it feels a little surreal. Like, listen, I'm always just, I'm the sister. I'm Gina. Like I like to my older brothers, I'm still Gina. They're always going to tease me and to like my younger sister. I'm still her, you know, you know, my sister, my sister who lives out in LA, who was at our evening, our opening, opening launch of the book that uh, Phil Rosenthal and Monica Rosenthal so generously hosted and Red Cat, um, Cal Arts. It was when we managed to do it safely with the with the ever shifting guidelines. It was an incredible night. Um, yeah, it was a great night. A super powerful discussion too. I must add, but like so, like my sister has like she always saw me this is interesting because now they're all reading the book my sister read it earlier on and she kind of called me and she, we have gotten so much clip my baby sister and I have always been close but we have gotten so much closer over the course of this pandemic because we spent so much time together I haven't been with any of my siblings in a true sense of the word time we're talking like not even a week spent with them since I was 16. So like yeah. we, it, it's it's weird to think of my actual f- blood relatives as people who have do not know me that and the people who really truly know me are work employees because I spend more like my life my work it just requires me to spend so much time away from home so that's been a weird sort of. Um, juxtaposition if you will and a weird uh, reality even just coming home with my parents my parents sometimes think I'm still this 15 year old girl that they dropped off because like we're kind of stuck in that time now yeah, after sure. reading it's the like book it's like an arrested development sort of in a way. yeah so I know but like did you 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 did get some special treatment because I know that your mom you know, would would like portion your meals and put them separate from everybody else's in the refrigerator. I mean, that's only because like I had three brothers who like uh, yeah. brothers will eat everything and they're giant. Oh, like, you know, my my brother's like six foot four. And so like it was just to make sure I had food and that, like she they were yeah. asleep when I came home. But yeah, just yeah, to make yeah. sure like, yeah, my mom's an Italian mom. She's going to make sure I'm fit. <laughs> well, that's the other thing. My mom's Italian as well. So, God, we have so many things in common. And I only have one brother in my family. There's five girls, one boy. But my mother would make my brother sit down at 6 p.m. every night for dinner. And he would eat a, bo- a box of macaroni and cheese. Mm. He'd eat the whole goddamn box. My, my mom would cook him a box of macaroni. And that would be the first part of his meal, you know, to put in his stomach, at, like your brother, tall and athletic. And anyway, and then the rest of us all sat down at 6.15. So there's now there's eight of us around the table and we'd all have a portion. And then when we were done eating, my, my mother would just nod to my brother like, go ahead, Scotty. And then he cleared the table because he was an eating machine. Yes. And he... And even to this day, my brother does not take, I don't even care if he's listening to this. I'll tell you right now. Scotty, he doesn't take a fork to his mouth. He puts his head to the plate and he just shovels like, ah, ah, ah. he just eats so much food. Men and, well, and especially boys, God damn, they eat a lot of food, right? Well, I would venture that ballerinas eat a lot of food, too. That's a misnomer that we don't eat. So I also eat a lot. And so she knew that I was training. And so just like making sure that everyone had enough. And and so, yeah, it's just like you just also what's great. Here's the ticket. What I've learned in my many years of, of being in relationship with the opposite sex is that men don't look that far into the fridge. So if you're trying to, to really, truly hide something, <laughs> just put it in the back. 
And so yeah. that's what my mom would do. It just would be in the back of the fridge. And I would ask that's her, I'd be like, so why, funny. why is it so, why do I have to like go past the milk and the orange juice and the le- le- leftovers from two days ago to get to my dinner? She's like, cause they're not looking that far, dear. <laughs> that's so cute. Boy, she must have been so happy to have you because it was three boys in a row, right? Uh, so, no, it was actually the rundown goes Stacy, my oldest half sister, Joseph, oh. Tony, myself, straight up middle child, if you can't tell already, right, then Corey, right. Christina. Right, exactly. Okay, okay. And all very Catholic names, aren't they? They are, aren't I, they? Yeah, yeah, very, so. very Catholic Italian names. I mean, you, it, we have yeah. double Catholic. You had Filipino Catholic, too, on top of uh-huh. it. My dad. Um, yeah. Yeah, so just like a big old family. And Filipino Catholic is very straight up as well. I mean, it's it's pretty serious. I mean, in terms of like the mass, I mean, it's the same mass, but I mean, it's die hard, don't you think? I mean, there's devotion. It's just yeah. it's this devotion, and it's and it's That's there. And, and my That's... and my devotion doesn't necessarily come out in a religious sense. It comes out in my devotion to dance. And I yeah. think, um, you know, I I. I just thought that was very sweetly said by you and very <laughs> pedestrian. You know, it's a devotion. <laughs> uh, wait here, okay, so now your brothers and sisters have normal careers. But here's the thing that sets it apart. They go to New York City and you can take them backstage, right? You can show them. I mean, and they know dancers and singers. And have they all been up, et cetera, to see you? Um, and- Surprisingly, not that often. I mean, like, so my sister lived in New York and she's she's probably she was on a career trajectory to be another dancer. And when I oh. and it should be said that once I got my apprenticeship with New York City Ballet, she took one look at my life and was like, never mind. We're not. You know. <laughs> uh, and she chose a career even harder, um, which is, you know becoming a mom but <laughs> like <laughs> that so is true. in it, a way yeah it's even harder um but i think where uh my siblings it just seems so disparate from their lives you know like you're from a small town it's very easy to stay in the small town and so yes they've come to see me do performances about like there are some like i still have to tell they my parents were never stage parents in that sort of sense in the word. Like I still call them and have to tell them, they're like, Oh, I'm working on this new piece. It's going to be a premiere. This is actually a big deal. And you, I really want you to make the effort to come because they, they're like New York city is a lot of sensory overload for many people in my family. And they, we've got kids and, and like sometimes New York city is too much for me, which is why I love LA. You can be in a car. You don't have to be in that crowded subway. <laughs> yeah, no, it's um, true. I, it, yeah, it, it's true. Uh, so what's up with ballerinas always sewing their shoes? Can you tell me what is that about? Because I feel like just get new ones. I mean, why is everybody always with a there's a needle and a thread in every ballet scene I've ever seen in my life? What's going on? <laughs> uh, well, there's a, there's a simple explanation to that. So the the point shoe is a slipper. And so when it comes to us, yes, and we have various like I in a normal season, I would go through sometimes five new pairs and and so they they don't come pre sewn, and so when you're talking about the specificity of and everyone's body is different, correct? So um, my shoe requires different sewing needs. So for a while, I'm thro- and for the people who are listening to this, I'm about to put my foot up into the thing to show her Fabulous. because I'm that kind of person. Um, so like the slipper will go on. There's no nothing to hold the shoe on. So there's no sole. There is a sole. I don't have one here. Um, they're down, they're downstairs. There's a so yeah. They're not made of wood. There, it's like a cardboard and paste. And so there is a sole. There's usually like um, a, like a suede sole on the inside and outside, and lots of card. Like, there's a cardboard shank, is what we. And so that that shank is then customized once it's in like my hands to my arch to my foot when it's pointed. And so each ballerina sews on ribbons and elastic to keep that shoe on the foot. So they don't come pre-sewn. And so that's why also 
being a ballerina comes with a very rudimentary skill set of being a seamstress. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's just so interesting because, you know, your feet do get mangled, don't they? Or, or is it not mangled, but you have to develop corns and calluses and... Right? Yes. Corns and cal- uh, uh, not cor- corns can be painful, but calluses on the feet are essential. Like when I, when I get a pedicure, the, uh, the, uh, the women that I go to um, for some self-care in the middle of a season, they know that I'm a ballerina and they, uh, they'll say like at the end of the season, I usually say, have at it, take all the calluses off. So I'm just going to build them again. But in the mid season, they're like leave callus. And I'm like, yes, definitely leave leave them. So it's like they help. And you, you know, like with anything you build up a tolerance. And so just the the point shoes, uh, and so like the sewing, the sewing of that is like, I've had to, you know, I sew it right here on my right foot where my midfoot is completely permanently shifted to the left. So it looks like a Z. <laughs> so wow. I su- use my ribbons to help support that, that shift. Of so there's bone. no, there's no size of ballet slipper. They don't come in a size. They do actually. They do. They what do. Size do you wear? I wear a size five, which is normally point shoe sizes run about two and a half sizes smaller than what your shoe size is. Oh so um, it sounds so painful. I mean, it's it's not it, well. It it's a process, right? This is why you once you start once you have enough muscle strength as a young dancer, you you start building the strength to be able to hold yourself up on point. And so, yes, I call I affectionately call them the toe boots. So the float, <laughs> so my work boots are a size five. My shoe size is a size seven and a half. And I thought that it was a block of wood in the toe. No? That is totally false. No. And has it always been false? Yes. Um, yes, I would say it, was, it, it has always been false. The It's always been just a way to lift the, how the point shoe was created was to create this like look of etherealness that the w- woman is rising off her feet. So I don't think that, that I, I mean, like we can fact check this, but I don't think wood has ever been used in a point shoe. Uh, do men also go on point? Yes, there's a, the whole um it's ballet companies of men that dance on point. I think it's wonderful for men to also learn how to, how that the physics changes because your center of gravity being on a demi point, which is just like, if you, uh, listeners, if you were to just raise your heels off the floor, that's what we call a demi point. It's a different amount of friction. And so when men and women are partnering or women and women are partnering, it's, 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 you have a much smaller surface, on which to balance and to so could both people be in point shoes at the same time in in terms of when they do the lifts with you if you're in a lift could they be on point also uh no way i don't think that that would be advised someone yeah. needs to be grounded i mean they could be wearing point shoes but i think it's unlikely that they would be up on point i bet you never know yeah you never know something that i really like about your book is that it it really shows the day in the life of a of a ballet dancer and behind the scenes in the New York City Ballet. And I have been in New York many times, and I was just there in May. And at one point, I saw actually it was this one little ballerina, and she was kind of running theater to theater. And I just thought, oh my god, I want to be her so bad. She's like eighteen, you know. But I'm just thinking, like, oh, just like how bright her future could be. I, I know, and in the book you describe, there's a lot of, of negative stuff that goes on too. And, and I mean, there's a whole, you know, God, we could talk about eating disorders for the whole the whole hour. I mean, you could, you know, you could go into the problems and, and also the, the racism in ballet. And I mean, I can't believe you're the first New York City soloist to be of the Asian race, really? I, I'm the first woman that has made it through. Now, like the first female Asian American soloist in New York City Ballet's 70 year history, and I think that it's is just that so is unbelievable. It's wild to think about, and it's also wild to think about how um, still in this day and age, and even in this art form, it, it should be mentioned that m- men have been able to to break this glass ceiling. And I think it's now, now as we talk about and empower more women, I think it's an important story for um, any, 
any person of color, anyone who wants to be a dancer to, to sure. listen to and read and, and kind of get what, what it's really like, but also just how much love of the art you really must have to become a dancer. Yeah. It takes a certain commitment and, and drive. Right. I mean, Gina, at your level, it's not for fun anymore. I mean, this is your life. I mean, su- I mean yeah, surprisingly, it still is a lot of fun, but yeah. it is my life and it is my job. And that's why I'm just like, I sit here talking to you and I just did, I just did a previous interview and I, I had to say, and like, that's all things hoping, like we're still on the edge. Like everything could be shut back down again. Like we're, we're not, I know. We are not out of the woods yet. Like, I'm really hoping we get to get on the stage. No, I hear you. Also, and then we're going to get right over to the story. Why why do you say, why did you say Black Swan is such shit? Because I really enjoyed that movie. Well, I mean, are you paraphrasing me? I did. Did I say that? I think, don't get me in trouble. Don't get me in trouble with Darren Aronofsky. I think you did. I think you said with that piece of shit. So I think, or you said something. No, yeah, I don't think I said that. What is the I'm quote? Katie, it. can we find I'm the gonna quote? I'm going to find it. It's going to be Gina. Yeah. I, Gina Paskogan on Darren Aronofsky. No, but what, what, what was the problem with the movie? Um, I think it just, I, so it's not a problem with, the movie it's like it's so i feel like the general hollywood idea of what a dancer is is that all ballerinas have eating disorders and daddy issues and there's this inherent obviously there's inherent drama to a life in the arts Mm -hmm. correct um but i just think it, it focused in on a lot of you know it's a it's a it was supposed to be a thriller and dark. And and I think it missed the mark on what's also so great and fun about the Mm -hmm. ballet. There's a lightheartedness to being in this space and getting to do what one's, what one Mm -hmm. loves. And it, yes, it requires immense sacrifice, but also like I, what I wanted to do was kind of break down like the the ballerinas that I surround myself with the men and women, like we are all extremely intelligent individuals. And not only have we dedicated our lives to this practice of craft, but we also have outside. And and, and like, this is also like something that's being accepted. The fact that you can have outside interests and use those interests to help um, make one's individual art grow and feel more um, rich in flavor. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that it, it, it missed. Well, you talk a lot in the book about Balanchine. Is that how you say it, Balanchine? Yes, George Balanchine. George Balanchine and his, you know, his method of ballet and how everybody, you know, held that up to be perfection. But uh, it, 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 it always will be a standard, right? It will always be... That will always exist. Now, hopefully there'll be something different, but that will always be, right? Um, can you help clarify what you mean by the a, a standard? Are you talking about like the stand, a Eurocentric idea of what a ballerina is? Like, well, like, cause- well, yeah, in terms of like, you know, how the costumes get passed down, like those couple of uh, that one costume you wore that was hand painted by Chagall. Is that true? But yes, it, it, it was that, that like there are, we wear works of art That's as well saying. as performing works of art, which yeah. is like it's really it's really incredible, incredible. So, yes, there is an absolute legacy to the world of ballet that goes beyond just um, passing down this art form that has been in existence since the time of Louis the Fourteenth. Right. So, okay. like, yes. But but here's here's what I'm, I'm getting I'm getting at when I first saw. Broadway plays back in the 80s and I remember seeing Cats and Les Mis and you know those were the big ones and then Phantom of course when when, when I saw those like, everybody on stage was dancer thin everybody on stage seemed to be you know obviously the best singers the best dancers the best actors and now when I go to see Hamilton or whatever luckily it is more mixed and it seems there's a lot of heavy set people straight up that seem heavy set Set, but then they have these opera voices or, or whatever. So it does seem to have changed already in the last 30 years. But I guess we're talking about ballet. I think it's like, I think what we where my line is and what I try to do through my diversity and initiative, Final Bow for Yellowface mm-hmm. and in my activism of just 
being a multicultural woman mm-hmm. holding space at the New York City Ballet is like w- for some for the art form of ballet to be able to survive into the future sh- future for shows for Broadway to be able to continue to be relevant. We need to represent the people who sit in the audience mm-hmm. on our stages as well. And like and yes, I like I talk about it. Like there was an extreme ideal of what a ballerina looks like. And that doesn't necessarily need to be upheld in every which way. I think there is room to allow more ethnicity, Absolutely. more inclusivity in within the confines of like, yes, ballet is about lines. So that we have to achieve that line. But every person's line is individual to them. So being in your best shape is going to look different than the woman next to me or the man next to of me. Course. That's that's what yeah. that's the point I'm trying to make right. in the book about that. Right. Like it, and if you were to look at the Rockettes, don't you all have to be the same size or something of the same height or something? They try to do that with the Rockettes. I can't speak yeah. to that. No, I don't, I'm, I'm just thinking. Not. No, I'm just thinking. But I, but I know what you mean because there's a, a th- certain thing they want: long necks. They want a certain turnout. They want a certain arch. I mean, it's so specific. And does it all come down to, you know, the ballet master, like a, a Peter Martin's guy? Uh, no, the, the the molding of a body into a body that can dance, that can be a body that can be on. Um, regardless of shape, Mm -hmm. like that molding comes from training Mm -hmm. that. So like you learn how to point your foot in the correct ballet line. You just like you learn how to sing. Mm -hmm. It's not just like, yes, when it comes to like, uh, who eventually gets to be in the very select group of professional ballerinas and dancers. Like some of that is God, uh, it has to be God given. Mm -hmm, It's like some of it's, it's determined by your, your, your how, what your makeup yeah, is. Sure. Yeah, a little bit. But then there's a lot that proper training can do. Yeah. And, um, Dedication. Yeah. So, like, that, I just want to make that specific point is that, like, that's why the training is so intense. It's mm-hmm. much like training to become an Olympic athlete. Oh, even it's, more so. It's, you yeah. Know, it, it, I just can't get over. Yeah. And I'm thrilled to hear about that in your new book, Swan Dive, The Making of a Rogue Ballerina, because the dedication is just so intense. And, you know, you always miss holidays and you're away from your family and... Anyway, the point is you really have broken through the mold and here you are now. You're still dancing over 20 years with the New York City Ballet and now you're an author as well. By the way, how did you never pick up on the Pittsburgh accent and does your family have it? Um, no, because like my dad has like a pretty thick um Filipino. It has a very interesting like mixture. So like some. I grew up hearing him speak and then my mom, I I think she has speaks in more of like the Pennsylvania accented. I mean, I still say pillow. Yeah. Instead of pill. That's pillow. pillow. Oh my gosh. That's I say pillow. What other word did someone say? Ask, tell me it's it's in there. You just have to like, listen very closely for it. Do you say you got to read up the house or the house? Read up the house? No, I say house. There's something about pop. I say pop. Yeah, pop, of course, not pop. soda. Do you do you say um it's so funny. Pittsburgh's so funny. Do you say Yin's guys? Yeah, I've heard Yin's guys. I don't it's not it's not really in my vocabulary, but if I'm yeah. here I'll be like Yin's guys. I, I'll say it yeah. as a joke, but yes, I'm aware. Sure, sure, sure. And get at. Just get at, you know, <laughs> get at. That's a big one. And then the other one I say a lot is jag off. You know, I'll just say, Don't be such a jag off. Like, uh, see, I don't know that one. That's a good one. Yeah, I like Jagoff. <laughs> anyway, listen, we're going to get over to your story, which basically we're really into your story. We're just going to hear a little more about the book, which I'm excited to, to hear about. But before we do, I want to tell everybody that we are live back at the Hollywood Improv playing Story Smash, the storytelling game show. The next show is August 28th. It's a Saturday night, and we should be on back on schedule every month at the Hollywood Improv, 7.30 p.m. Go over to, Hollywood, go over to HollywoodImprov.com. 
come get your tickets. They're gonna they're gonna sell out each show. I guarantee because we're also starved for entertainment. And I got Danny Zucker back and Blanca Patch and Melissa Peterman. And so you guys check out StorySmashShow dot com for updated uh, dates at the Improv. And we might also be doing some remote stuff with Rush Ticks. We'll see about that. All right, you guys. You've heard her talking. The amazing Georgina Pascogan, and she does have this new book, like I said, Swan Dive: The Making of a Rogue Ballerina. And you know, you really cover a lot in the book, like I've said. And you guys head over to GeorginaPascogan dot com, and there you will find a lot more about you, Gina, and some beautiful pictures. Oh, thank I you. mean, my God, have you ever taken a bad picture? Uh, yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. There's an equal number to every pretty picture that you think is pretty, which I'm so thankful for. Oh, there just... is an outtake. Uh, the whole book, co- yeah. the, like I must say that the book cover photo was an outtake yeah. of a 12 hour photo shoot done with my dear friend, photographer, Matt Karras. That is an outtake wow. that they were like, yeah, no, no, that's wow. the one. And I was like, wait, 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 what? But that's like, I was like, we took beautiful ballet photos and it's like a lesson in marketing. (laughs) But they were like, no, this is going to intrigue people to pick up the book. So I really really hope that it does. A lot of, uh, yeah, a lot of attitude. You're sitting in like a a silver beanbag chair with a little pink tutu and you're, you are in the toe shoes with your fingers, with your toes on point and you're elbows resting on your knees like okay are we done here or what and it's very it is very funny I mean, we were just taking a break and i just like did something and he said to me and i was like uh-huh yeah. and then it turned out to be the one that they wanted so funny <laughs> so funny so like they gave me the title they got the picture they wanted how about that yeah that's right well now and and also though in different in different countries, the the photo is different, right? Indeed. So the the the, the UK photo, which is very interesting, you can you can I'm sure you, the readers you could Google it. The UK photo, you'll it. get like that was one of the one of the pictures that we were going for to give them like this these options. So you're basically upside down. I made a swan dive. Flying yeah. through the air. Yeah. You're flying through the air. Now, was somebody catching you or what was that? How were you? I'm not. Do you really think I'm going to give away my magic, Christine? (laughs) Gina, I can't believe what you do. I seriously, your body is just, it's just phenomenal what you've trained it to do and how it's just, you know, is everybody in your family super healthy and strong? Let me ask you that. Is it a genetic Um, thing? Well, I am quite lucky that my family does seem to be super healthy, super strong. Um, my brother, my brother, they're all, they all could have been athletes, but like the breakdown is they're mostly doctors and pharmacists and they save people on, in ways that I wish I could, you know, like I, you know, my, yeah. my dad was a general surgeon. My mom was a nurse. So I am, I am that kind of family. So I am really am the black sheep artist <laughs> that like went a totally different route. But like, I I, th- I think it's it goes to mention that like everyone has the same. It's an amazing what a body can be trained to do. To and yes, I am admitting that I have a certain God given talent to be able to uh, coordinate movement, and this is this is a, obviously a gift that is beyond beyond training. But like, I I think it's amazing as we think about like all of our bodies are incredible. The fact that we can like build mm-hmm. it like it's just the body in itself is incredible and like yeah i'd go there yeah i'll say that we all yeah, have I'll incredible bodies sure. i don't want you to sit there and think that your body is less than mine because it's certainly not no no, no, no. i you know i feel strong you know i think it's all amount of it's all a matter of you know it sounds so simple but it's eating well <laughs> i know it's so stupid but it is it's eating well what are you putting in your body and then how much energy are you putting out that's it and it's very personal and everybody can decide their own who cares you know <laughs> at the end of the day but i'm just saying when i see ballerinas the athleticism and you really get to see their body and you get to see everything to, that makes them that athlete in other words if you watch football or hockey for god's sakes you can't you can't discern anything you can't see the people but you know i and i also respect basketball for that as well you know really being able to see the body and and the strength so i was just thinking about that also you were talking about the antics backstage and you do talk about so many funny antics backstage like one thing I never would have known this ballerinas bring their dogs to work. <laughs> so there's dogs running around backstage, including your black lab, Jet. 
Nice. Yes. By the way, I have a little one of my very best friends. Her name is Margot Black, and her son, his name is Jet, and he. Uh, has it's such a great name. Mom's last name, and so his name is Jet Black pretty cool. I love it. I, I love, love it. that. I know me too. But anyway, you talk about these dogs and one of the dogs peed on the solo with ballet slippers. I mean, yeah, it's like there's a it's a whole community. When you spend that much time in a theater and like having and caring for an animal is a tether to the outside world, correct? Yeah. If you if you look at it that way, for me like Jet is a constant reminder that like there is stuff that's going on like like that is always is an outside world, but like she is like, it doesn't matter how well I think I did on stage. I'm still going out the stage door and I'm picking up Jet's poop on our walk home from the theater. And I think it's a very, it's a nice humbling balance to like get the upstanding O and then go pick. And then uh, my dog's just looking at me and they're like, you go, you're going to pick this up, correct? It keeps <laughs> you in the moment though. It does. I think that's very fair to say. And I think like dogs are so they're such it's a high stress environment. There's no there's no denying that being a dance it's like how especially at New York City Ballet, which is so incredible. We put out so many ballets a season. Where our, my life is so fast paced. There's always something happening. It requires a certain amount of, um, uh, for lack of a for lack of a better word, and going for a bad pun, flexibility just mm-hmm. in in being able to shift modes. And fill in when there's an injury or and so on and so forth. I think like having animals around who are such an unconditional source of love, it helps helps kind of like even out the stresses of a life in the arts. Yeah, Um, I can see that. I can see that. But tell us just real quick about the day when the dog peed on on that girl's ballet slipper. Oh, so this is this is pre jet. This is my friend uh, Savannah's dog, Alfie, who was just being integrated into the senior core dressing room. So there's one special dressing room that you you aim to be in because if you're with like you're with the senior core women who are just like that. They're, they're just powerful. And, and, and that's so, who you are right now, right? I I'm I have since graduated to to soloist, wow. but I have been in the senior court women's dressing room. It's like I write a ho- it's a whole chapter. Sh- dressing room nineteen is forever. The bonds that are created there, it it's it's just a magical microcosm of the microcosm that is New York City Ballet. So like think there's just like uh, <laughs> just like more and more stories that come from. But yes, yeah, so Alfie feed on a pair of ribbons of the one woman who was not a huge fan of having the dog in the dressing room and so she called me in a panic and she was like what am I going to do and I was like okay first things first where exactly is it on because you know dancers use water to soften point shoes so like it would have been terrible if this dog had relieved itself on the the actual the box of the shoe. Yeah. She was like, it's just in the ribbons. I was like, this is a breeze. Go rinse those ribbons off. Grab the hairdryer from the top of the spots. No harm, no foul. Where the real foul happened was when another dog, who shall remain nameless, ate an entire cheesecake while we were on stage, ready to do like a triple show night came up expecting to have a nice dessert for all of us and this tiny little dog had eaten the whole damn thing we were so lit that must have been insane i wish somebody should have ordered another one right away how did that dog not get sick I don't know, but the dog was completely guilty and we were so upset. Like, it's just, you know, dancers, it, it, I think it's fair to say that like dancers take, when we, when we do eat, when we refuel, like you're doing it for a reason. And like, this ch- obviously was a choice that like, we are going to have this cheesecake. We have earned it. It's amazing. And to have it been eaten by like a like five to seven pound dog. Yeah. The whole thing it just was wild. The dog is the dog is perfectly okay, guys. I don't yeah. want anyone anyone yeah. who's like concerned about the wear. Like he's he's okay. And what <laughs> happened with the dog who shit on your loofah? Oh, that's the same dog. That dog was problematic. 
<laughs> so you're in the I, bathroom. I love how we've just shifted and we're just telling the story of poop well, loofah instead. Well, you, seriously, you were in the shower and you, and you, uh, I would have just. Well, it's after another hard yeah. show day. And so like that we do have showers in our dressing room and, and we were in the queue and for, I, I had, I don't know if I had a date that night. I'd some, for some reason I ended up being first in the queue to help in the shower. Um, so, you know, ran in, this is after the dog had eaten the cheesecake like weeks before and I come in and I go to grab my loofah which is there and somehow it's just like not in the place it's supposed to be and I look down and in the stall is my white loofah with like these just wonderful gifts from this dog that it was already on thin ice (laughs) <laughs> and I like screamed, you know, like, uh, like clearly I'm naked. I'm like about to get in the shower. I come out, <sighs> like, this is enough. Yeah. That, come in I, here. Everyone come in here. Witness. Witness line. this. Yeah. But we took it. We, there is a picture of it. I do not have it on call. However, we have a picture of Poop Lufa. And one of my dear friends, Hankish, like she will text it to me every once in a while just to remind me of some of the shit that we have gone through yeah it's so funny and, and colleagues it just gives such your book gives such a great inside look at that it's world. not a normal office story it's, it's so normal- <laughs> well it's so interesting and you're all pretty much so flipping young and so it just seems like part a blast and part a curse or, or part like uh, a dungeon you know when you have you know you do three performances in a day uh, but you like know. you thrive off of that it doesn't yeah. feel like it like so where where I have qualms with how the ballet world is the power structure in ballet is not necessarily when it where it comes to like the sacrifice like I to there's nothing that makes you feel more um, purposeful as a dancer in the core or a solo dance or like or even a ballerina to be able to dance in three ballets in a show. There's nothing. It feels so good. And like when I was when I was in Cats, just to be to be Victoria and to be on stage for that entire two and a half hour span and knowing that just like just because I happen to be in this white unitard and this blue lighting, they are going to see me everywhere. So like I had to be on that entire show. It's a new challenge. And I think like nowhere, I don't think anyone would fault. No dancer is going to fault that sacrifice. I think when the sacrifices come, it's when you are unfairly um, compared to another dancer's body when you feel like you are at your fittest, when you are um, told that to look, which I have been, to look less oriental on stage and to like just stagger over how so many things are wrong with that sentence. And, and, And then to, I think, to not have agency as a person because you only get your schedule 48 hours in advance and when I first started, it was, and that's an improvement. When mm-hmm. I first started, we got our schedule the night before at around oh, nine or God. 10. Oh, no. And like, so it, it, that those, those are the sacrifices that I think that we can shift and change. Mm-hmm. You're never going to become a professional dancer if you have a problem with giving your all in three or to five ballets a night. Like that is, that is the job. And I think that, 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 essentially if people will get organically um we not we weeded out it's a bad term but like that like that it kind of organically sorts itself sure because there are a lot of dancers that do get into the new york city ballet and go through a season or two and they're like this is too much or they want yeah they want to be something else you know they change their mind yeah and and it's like also like else Yeah. So like, I think those, those, I just want to make it clear that like, it, that's, that's not the, like, it, that's where the commitment to the love of ballet comes in is everyone wants to dance all the time. Mm -hmm. I hear what you're saying and you are pushing for change and you do talk about how ballet is not a democratic system. It's just not, it's not the way it works. And what you want is to be on your own merit. That is what matters. 
Well, I think I think it's important for the conversation is talk, uh, touched upon is that it is, it is important for our our artistic directors. So, like the artistic director makes all of the decisions. So all right of the now, casting. that's Jonathan Stafford. Yes, mm -hmm. that is correct. So, like he is deciding casting. He that it's it's not like a Broadway show where they have a call and you can go and audition. No, they're like so. It's like you can see how. It's possible for a personal bias to seep in when one has um, control of decisions like that. And then and I think that's why we are having in awkward and uh, conversations that focus on how are we making it actionable being inclusive as a ballet company whatever as we continue to learn as a society i think we're taking these these lessons that we've all learned in this time off where we weren't in the space together and now we're trying to apply them mm -hmm. and it's a little bit of a back and forth because yes we like yes absolutely everybody wants to get back on stage we want new york city ballet to survive through this and we are so grateful that like thank god new york city ballet is is somewhat financially sound but there, and there are a lot of companies who, and I'm so privileged and lucky to be able to say that I dance with City Ballet and and know that they are more well off than some of the smaller companies. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, no, it's it's beyond impressive. It's you know, it's really the top of the top of the top of the ballet world is to be with the New York City Ballet. I mean, I think that's that's for sure. So you you've already accomplished so much, Gina. And this book is really going to get people behind the scenes of ballet and get to see a lot of really funny stuff and then a lot of crazy stuff and a lot of scary stuff. And, and luckily it has changed. Do you see it changing from that one artistic director to maybe a panel of people making decisions? Um, That's an interesting idea. Hey, why um, don't you tell them Christine Blackburn threw that out? <laughs> Christine Blackburn's story where they very interesting throw that idea. Out. Yeah. Um I I don't know if it's going to change in that sort of way. Are we going to have more diverse voices as leaders of ballet companies? Absolutely. I can't wait for that to happen more. I can't wait for more strong women to lead ballet companies. I can't, where I think change could happen first is like let, and, and it's where I'm thinking about like, where do I want my career to go next? What am I like? This is like, okay. So like, I've had a pretty awesome career and like, I know I bitch about it in the book a little bit, but like for, in generally, it's like, unbelievable. It's kind of it, it, awesome. It's an unbelievable and career. I've, I've gotten to work with some incredible people and I, I've, feel like I have I want I want to create a space that feels safe for young people because it is an it's a young person's game you know like I don't I like I hope I get to dance well into my 40s but it's not a given mm -hmm. who knows and to dance ballet is it is it is it an extreme art form um like the demands of different um dance languages are different. So I might, I might shift, who knows? Like yeah. I, I might want to continue exploring what it means to tell stories on camera. Uh, that is super uh, fascinating to me. And Gina, you're um, obviously an actress because you've done plenty of acting. I, well, I, I say like, you know, when it comes to like, everything's about like how many followers you have and what's your, what's your cache, how much money you're going to make. But it's just like, I'm kind of like, where's the quality of the work. And sure. so like when I, when I pitch myself for things or someone pitches for me, I always like to say like, please do mention that being a ballerina is basically like being a silent actress. I've already been a silent actress yeah. for very, very, very many years. And I am, I do. And being able to speak lines and remember lines is a completely different technique. I also am trained in that as well. So if you, if you like my dancing, 
how I can communicate with no words. Yeah. I guarantee you, you're going <laughs> to like what I'm able to give when I'm able to talk. <laughs> Listen, we, we have to wrap this up, but one more, one more quick thing. After all this ballet, all these years, when you left the New York City ballet to go do Cats for a couple of years and then let, and then went back to ballet. But when you did that, was that like a piece of cake to you? The, no, the it was so thing? hard. I know. Wait, wait, wait. Okay. Beyond the um, stamina of, of how long the rehearsals and stuff, but, 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 but you didn't have to do the crazy stuff you did in ballet. I mean, or did you keep it up during that? Oh, I absolutely kept it up, but I also learned trial by fire. And, um, and so Andy Blankenbuehler, who was the choreographer for that show and the entire creative team casting crew, like, like, just, I love that whole experience. It opened my eyes in such a way. <laughs> Cats um, is so flipping funny because sometimes you look at it and it's like, what the, what the fuck is oh, going wild. on? It makes, it's just it like makes... too crazy. It's like somebody's on drugs. I mean, it's just well, hilarious. I mean, that was, that was the thing. Jelly Lorem and Victoria, we run, we wanted to have a little side business of selling the little, like the CBD yeah. cookies, send them yeah, off on right. our way, come back and then experience the show. Be totally that's right. And by the way, I love your white costume and that. That's such a pretty costume thank you thank you very much i enjoyed that it like you know um andy and the creative team gave me and a, a chance for me to be soft and to be a completely different uh presence on stage than what had been given to me at city ballet and city ballet i play a lot of strong women i am a jumper and a turner what i mean by that listeners is that like i do a lot of like the split jumps like think of like gymnasts i excel at jumping and i also like to turn so revolve on the little tippy toes like so i'd never really get to do what we call a daggio movement which is slow and legato and like it, it, it so and so victoria even though she's a she's a young sprightly character cat um so like i could put this burst of energy in there but she's also this like beautiful sinewy so i got a chance to do adagio on stage in that and so like you ask if it was if it was easier i think it was easy it was it it must have I been more fun in a way. I can't Were say you it was easy. It was time? outrageously fun. <laughs> I think if anyone has the chance, I, yeah. I keep on requoting my friend Christopher Gurr, who uh, played uh, Gus, is to like if you get the chance to be part of a cultural phenomenon, do it. Absolutely, <laughs> say yes because it's so it is bizarre. it's just fantastic and wild and. There were things that were so much harder doing the same show every single night, keeping one's body healthy, dancing on a rake stage, yeah. which is a tilted stage, which in the time before we started to rake the audience, you, you, uh, uh, listeners, when you go into the movie theater and you see how the, the, the seats are raised, that's a that's what we call like a um it's this right. It's like a, a diagonal. So yeah, the, for the longest the time, the audience was not on the angle and the performers were on the angle. So in this case, since the cats are on the ground, the, it made sense to angle the stage. But then, like, I don't get the nice, cushy ballerina, like, bouncy floor. So this was yeah. like a legit metal yeah. stage. Oh and doing all of my ballet techniques. So yes, in that sense, I would say it was harder. And then just doing a two and a half hour show, being in my mid thirties, like I hadn't done that since I was like in my twenties. Yeah, sure. doing three, four ballets a night was until it at like the that Garden takes a toll. Still, it was not. It was at the Neil Simon Theater, which is oh, yeah, yeah. a wonderful, wonderful home, and I still will yeah. always probably consider it my my home on Broadway. Oh yeah, to be in those different theaters and to think what has been done there, it just must be. You know, to be backstage, I've never been backstage one of those theaters, and I just think that. Well, you have like, you have to come to New York, and I will make sure that you're able to come back. Amazing, yeah. My daughter's 14; she's a dancer. She's danced all her life, uh, but it's hip hop. But she's just she's very good, and I would love. I'm going to bring her. Oh, one more thing: the Nutcracker is so flipping racist; it's not even funny. So, are they going to change that? I mean, can that be changed? Absolutely. I think there's always room for change. I mean, like what we do as an art form, ballet is so ephemeral. What I do on stage one night is impossible to be recreated just because my body, my body ages from that night to the, the next night. And so like ballet is meant to be, it, it, it's it's been formulated like that, which is why 
uh, co-founder Phil Chen and I, like we, we create, we advocate for better Asian representation on stage. Like these changes, it's not just like, we're not asking, it's not like a Van Gogh, which is like, it's not like the book, like people, I mean, not everyone's happy with the book there. There's nothing really I can change in that book that you have in your hands, Christine, because it's, it's mm-hmm. static. However, the performances, a piece like Nutcracker, we can make it so it's a global tour with a yeah. global lens, not yeah, just what happened? from like Hamilton does it. Yeah, I think it's, it, it, it's possible. And, and conversations are being had. I want, I want you Good. to, to be, uh, take solace in that, like, we are doing doing the work. Um, Phil and I did not start this discussion. It had already been happening. We are just consolidating d- discussions, and we are taking those discussions further. Phil is an Asian ballet dancer, a male, of course. She, he is. She, um, he, Phil, is the co-founder of Final Buffy Yellow Face. He has not that danced professionally, but I call him my personal dance historian. He is wonderful. is yeah. wonderful, and so like through us, uh, we, you know, through we've joked with each other that like through his experience and my experience, you have you know, uh, like I take care of things that he might see from a woman's perspective, and he obviously has his own perspective. You know, he was born in Hong Kong and raised here in San Francisco. That's wild to like his experience. He also has a book, Final Buffer Yellow Face, which is wonderful. The wonderful read and insight too. So it's like, yeah. it's we, these are, we are trying to create change because I love ballet. And like, yeah. I wrote this book, Swan Dive, because I still believe in the inherent, beautiful qualities of ballet. Ballet can touch Everyone doesn't yes. matter where you're from, your creed, your color. It does not matter. Ballet is a universal language. And so I've made it my mission to hold the people that I work with and most importantly, myself accountable for pushing the art form into the future. Gina, you are so special, really. Dude, you are a really special person and you your life is so full of, of so much art and then but also the charity work that you do and how much you're giving and just name your cuz I want everybody to head over to georginapascogan.com and you can find more out about it. But the but your charity's name is what again? Something uh, so yellow. The, face? the initiative is called um Final Bow for Yellow Face. Final Bow for Yellow Face. Yes. Yes. And that's uh, yellowface.org. Yellowface.org. Okay, great. Yeah, so good for you, man. Congratulations on, you know, getting that started because that's got to feed a whole other part of your soul. So you got a lot going on. Your mom must be so damn proud of you, man. I'm telling you. I mean, they're still waiting me to be like, hey, what's are you going to be a lawyer yet? What's going on? Uh, <laughs> like, I love I'm your, not done dancing yet. I love your story. It's fabulous. You guys, again, head over and check out Georgina's website, georginapascogan.com. And also, you're on Twitter, aren't Aren't you? Because I, I thought I saw you, but I then I didn't. I'm on all the things. I think whether or not I un- I comprehend how to use them, <laughs> it doesn't matter. matter. No worries. Listen, thank you so much. But I am. I'm on Twitter, Instagram, all the all, all the things. good stuff. You guys, you'll see her there. All right, you guys. One more time on behalf of the very very funny and very talented Georgina Pascogan. Really, thank you for this conversation. This has been just great. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me, Christine. My pleasure. My name is Pennsylvania. Christine. Yeah. My name is Christine Blackburn saying, make it a story worthy week. We could have talked for four hours. I know. You can follow me. Follow me. I'll take you down to the Thanks for joining us on the Story Worthy Podcast. We'll be back next week with all new stories. Subscribe to Story Worthy on iTunes and visit the Story Worthy website at storyworthypodcast.com. I'll keep you